and welcome to the session that we're going to have today looking at the place of warfarin in the world of DOAC. So over the last decade we've seen a significant change in the way that we are offering anticoagulation to our patients going from a very labour intense situation which many patients enjoyed in the fact that they had to attend anticoagulation clinics, they managed to socialise with other people who were also anticoagulated, to a more isolated environment where you're receiving a DOAC um, for your um, thrombotic issue and your monitoring is minimised, which is great for some, maybe not for all, but we're now getting a little bit concerned now that we've seen the wave uh, move as to what is happening to warfarin. This is an incredibly useful uh, medication and it is not being used a bit like beta blockers in hypertension where the time has passed and we should be just updating. We are talking about a drug which still has a very active role as a therapy for the appropriate patient in the appropriate place. But it needs its supervision, it needs its monitoring. So we've brought together a panel to have a discussion as to where warfarin sits in this modern world and what should we be doing to make sure that it remains a safe medication. Now, my, my uh, team today is well known to many. Um, we have Helen Williams, who's a, a consultant pharmacist and an advisor uh, on the CBD agenda to the NHS. But we're going to start with Hayley Favell, who's going to take us through from the perspective of the anticoagulation service as was, as is, and maybe as will be. So it's an absolute pleasure to hand over to my, my friend and colleague, Hayley, to take the first presentation. Thank you. So hopefully you can see my slides. Yes. Yes, perfect. So where is warfarin in the world of DOAC? So I'm going to talk about what we experience at a local level and how COVID and DOAC have impacted on anticoagulant services use of warfarin. my declarations. So there have been massive changes in anticoagulant drugs since the development of warfarin after the deaths of hundreds of cows from eating mouldy sweet clover silage back in 1948. And warfarin, as you know, was first used as a rat poison. Then in America, FDA gave approval for human use in America in 1954. And then came the development of the DOAX. NICE produced its technology appraisal for stroke, stroke prevention in AF, the Dabigatran and Rivroxban back in 2012, then Apixaban in 2013, and Edoxaban in 2015. And the development of the DOAX has transformed anticoagulant services. No longer are we dependent on vitamin Ks, and their continual testing and dose titration as our only source of oral anticoagulation. Now, this graph shows the use of anticoagulant drugs since 2009. You can see warfarin in yellow at the top, rivaroxaban in red, light blue is a pixaban, Dabigatran in black along the bottom. As we all know, the usage of Dabigatran really hasn't increased. And then what you can see is a Doxaban in purple. I think if this was updated to 2022, we'd see an exponential increase in Doxaban's use with the commissioning statement. But what you can see is that certainly by 2014, the diagnosis of AF and the use of anticoagulants prophylactically was increasing. 
And then the decline of warfarin and the increase in the use of DOAX as our confidence grew in their safe use. And also from the success of national programmes like the Prevent, Detect, Perfect programme, pushing the use of DOAX from 2017. So cost trends, we know that warfarin is as cheap as chips. You can see here in 2015, oral anticoagulant cost was just at 1.8%. By 2019, that had grown to 6.7%. And that's because DOAX now make up 98% of the oral anticoagulant drugs cost. So the development of DOAX has transformed anticoagulant services, but we need to identify that in the UK there is a wide variation in the way that anticoagulant services are produced, it can be produced in secondary care, primary care, specialist community, by pharmacists, and it can be uh, delivered by highly specialised practitioners just in anticoagulant management, or it can be provided by professionals who have to provide anticoagulant management as part of multiple roles. I manage an anticoagulant service based in secondary care that's run by specialist practitioners who provide vitamin K antagonist management, DOAC initiation and conversion, bridging, et cetera, in Bournemouth and Poole. Now, the biggest recent push to change anticoagulant services internationally, nationally and locally was not only DOAX, but also COVID. Patients were being advised to stay at home by the government and therefore were reluctant to go outside their homes for iron or blood tests. A large number of patients were also receiving shielded letters, again, telling them not to leave their homes. Patients with COVID-19 or exposed to it were being told they'd got to isolate, so again, unable to access phlebotomy for INR monitoring. We know that GP surgeries, NHS services, all had the impact of losing some of their staff because of sickness due to COVID or isolation. And anticoagulant staff, like all staff, were identified at being at risk. I lost two of my staff who were shielded, so we had to identify new ways of working. Locally, we use a dose and post service. And prior to COVID, patients were assured of getting their dose instruction the following day. COVID impacted on Royal Mail services. And on the 31st of March, the national guidance was issued, the Clinical Guide for Management of Anticoagulant Services during the coronavirus pandemic. So what actions did we take? We had already taken actions by the 31st of March, and I'm sure we were no different to anybody else that was providing anticoagulant services facing the same dilemmas. We identified appropriate patients to convert onto DOAX and to enable us to prioritise, we contacted GPs, we got lists of shielded patients and then cross-referenced those shielded patients with patients next due date of INR. We set up remote training and clinics through Attend Anywhere and did video consultations. We checked bloods, cancelled and converted patients onto DOAX and posted new alert cards delivering drugs at home for shielded patients. We contacted um, PCN pharmacists through the Wessex AHSN to help GPs convert patients. And those that couldn't be converted, we discussed the use of self-test machines. And we supported district nurses to visit patients at home doing INR monitoring with point of care. And we visited patients at home requiring vitamin K reversal to avoid admission to hospital. We validated and set up emails and we converted some patients that couldn't be converted onto DOAX and were unstable on warfarin to low molecular weight heparin, particularly some of our valve patients. And of course, we followed 
these patients up, we did reviews. So what was the impact? Well, in the um, first six weeks, we converted 246 patients to DOAX. We did 112 reviews and we converted 284 patients onto emails. So COVID pushed us to convert patients from warfarin to DOAX. And of course, now the standard drug of choice when starting anticoagulation is a DOAX. Rarely do we initiate warfarin. So how has that changed the type of patient that we treat? Well, 10 years ago, Bournemouth and Poole had over 9,000 patients. We now have 1,544 but the complexity of these patients has changed. We've got 357 mechanical valves. We've got 69 patients, for example, with antiphospholipid. We've got 29 patients who are on a low thrombotic therapeutic range, 1.5 to 2.5. We've got 230 with a 2.5 to 3.5 range. We've got 146 patients whose target range is 3 to 4 and 18 patients whose target is 3.75 because we now have a very different makeup in our patients. We have the higher bleeding and the higher thrombotic risks. What we do know is that patients in the future are on vitamin K antagonists will be the more complex, the more fragile patients, the mechanical heart valves, those where DOACs don't have the license indication. And we know that the number of patients nationally is reducing on warfarin. But what we're seeing is not a reduction, the same reduction in the number of INRs and doses. So if you compare the number between 2012 and 2020 for our patients, we have 50% of the patients, yet we're still doing 80% of the INRs because what we know is that although the number of patients are going down, they're more complex, they need far tighter uh, titration. So what impact does this have reducing the number of warfarin patients? This slide shows adverse drug reactions. Orange is Rivaroxban and blue is Doex in total. And you can see Dabigatran introduction in green. Then later around 2012, you've got Apixaban in gray. And then of course, later in yellow, you've got Edoxaban. And what you can see is as each drug is introduced, you have higher number of ADRs, but as our use goes and our safety increases, then although the number of patients on these drugs goes up, the number of drug reactions go down. But look at warfarin, look at warfarin in red. So we've had 68 years of the use of warfarin, and yet the number of ADRs are going up because our clinicians' knowledge of use of warfarin is going down and the complexity of these patients are going up. So how do you maintain the quality of a service? Well, as a manager, I regularly monitor the TTR. I know that my service runs around about 78, 79%. I'd like to get it up to 100, but that's just never going to happen with the complexity of the patients. I ensure that all of the staff are trained and preceptored. They undergo competency assessment. They have a minimum of three months mentorship. We participate in national benchmarking to make sure that the service that we provide is in line with. Um, national um, achievements and I know that my service I'm pleased to say is one of the top performing in the country. We have to ensure that we continue to be patient-centred. I've got 151 patients that self-test. It would be much more so even though we live in quite an affluent area in Bournemouth and Poole, more patients would self-test if they could afford 
the Coaga check or self-testing machines. We involve decisions with patients. Um, we still have a decision aid which does talk about warfarin, but our discussions, we have to obviously take in mind the commissioning statement to guide our patients to the choice of DOAC. Because of the complexities of patients, we offer a same day referral, uh, particularly to our cardiologist, and we have links to inpatients, cardiology, pre-assessment for bridging. A lot of our time is taken up with education and training and teaching. Our F1s and new doctors in the trust get an hour and a half of training, a protected training on anticoagulation and an hour and a half on VTE. So we do all the training, but unfortunately what we've seen is because uh, clinicians are not um, dosing as many patients, we actually still see some issues and we're just expanding out to provide an inpatient dosing service. So in summary, what we're seeing is a reduction in the number of patients on warfarin, but that does not correlate with a reduction in the workload for anticoagulant services. So I don't think I'm going to be putting my feet up very soon. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Hayley. And we'll be having a, a discussion at the end. I, I just wanted to pull out one thread in what you said, because I know we are considering ourselves post-pandemic, but you and your team must be truly commended for switching 246 people from complex warfarin to other anticoagulation within six weeks. Um, I, yeah, I feel that is, is worthy of comment and commendation because <laughs> that's, that's real hard work uh, and clearly you've done that very safely uh, and I think it's worthy of comment. So thank you very much for your presentation. We'll be coming back to questions and discussion after we've heard from Helen Williams, if that's okay. Uh, Helen, over to you. Thanks, Matt. I'm just sorting out my slides. Hopefully, Oops. you can see those now. So, um, I sort of come at this at various levels. I'm I'm a commissioner within a South East London ICS uh, and a pharmacist by background, and also national specialty advisor for CBD prevention. And um, you know, very involved at the beginning of COVID in trying to ensure that anticoag services. Um, were supported really in terms of the issues that were raised by COVID. Those are my declarations and we'll touch on that a little bit uh, later. So you've already heard that uh, we're seeing increasing uses of DOACs um, and a reduction in the use of warfarin. So this shows the proportion of patients that are prescribed a DOAC versus um, a, a, as, a, as a percentage of all oral anticoagulants prescribed. So as the DOAC usage goes up, it, it indicates a reduction in the use of warfarin. And I've got some, some data showing that um, reduction in the total number of items of war, uh, warfarin that was issued in England. And you can see there has been about a 50% drop, probably slightly greater than that, um, up until 2022. And of course, we're not going to get rid of warfarin. We need warfarin for our patients that have mechanical prosthetic valves. Um, we need more warfarin for patients who have moderate to severe mitral valve stenosis, antiphospholipid syndrome, and then other patients that for various reasons aren't suitable for DOAC, although that might be the preferred first line cho choice, perhaps just their complexity, frailty, renal uh, function or dysfunction. So we still need warfarin. Obviously, the absolute number of patients receiving it is reducing, and that does as Hayley's already said, present some challenges in terms of service delivery. One of the outcomes of the work that happened uh, over COVID, so right at the beginning of COVID, towards the end of March, many of the uh, national bodies were saying switch water into DOAC um, without any context or advice. And so one of the things that we did early was to try and put some guidance in place. but Following the first year of COVID at a national level, we looked at coding and, and patients who were 
prescribed DOACs and whether there are any reasons they shouldn't be. Partly because people have noted patients coming into hospital with, with throm uh, thrombosis um, because they've been moved from warfarin to DOACs. And we'll look at those patients in a second. But when they ran a national level search across the GPIT systems, they found 750 patients that were prescribed a DOAC and also had a code for mechanical heart valve. That sounds horrendous, obviously, because we would want those patients to be warfarinized. It's not necessarily all a case of inappropriate switching during COVID, of course. And one of the big challenges that came out of it was that the coding for mechanical heart valves wasn't correct because people weren't distinguishing between uh, bioprosthetic uh, valves and mechanical heart valves. But it was obviously a massive concern and we needed practices to go and find out whether the coding for the valve was correct and then make sure that they were prescribed uh, uh, warfarin appropriately. So as a national level alert came out, 14 in instances that were known about that were found early um, and some of it was COVID related, some of it had happened before that, there was a lack of information about uh, why patients had been switched in, in some of these um, services. So at a national level, we were able to identify this as an issue, run the search and get the information out to um, general practice. But it does represent, as we become less familiar with warfarin, these very specific patients that need it um, may be forgotten about, not in terms of the warfarin, but people seeing DOAX as a preferred agent uh, may not recognise the need for warfarin um, in these certain circumstances. And it was particularly disappointing for me because I'd helped to author and, and got signed off uh, guidance for safe switching specifically to highlight the patients that shouldn't switch uh, because of these concerns about um, uh, people just in the context of COVID blanket switching everyone and not taking into account the um, the underlying reason for the anticoagulation, the possibility of comorbidities. So you might think they're on warfarin for AF, but they also have a mechanical valve. Guidance is still there. We've updated it um, in um, in uh, relation to the um, to the new commissioning guidance around DOAC, but warfarin to DOAC switching uh, guidance is still available to people and really keen that people still look at when they can do it safely and when they might not um, uh, it might not be appropriate for the individual patient. So how do we keep warfarin management safe? Well, way back in 2007, the National Patient Safety Agent, Agency did give us guidance on what we should be doing nationally and locally and within our services to ensure patients are safely um, prescribed warfarin and, and appropriately monitored. It's a bit hard to find this now because it's um, archived in the government documents. Uh, but most of the messages, if not all of them, still um, are really key and have already been highlighted by Hayley in her talk. But, you know, we need to ensure all our staff who are caring for patients on anticoagulation have the necessary work competences and that where there are gaps that they are addressed. We still have competency statements and guidance for all of the elements of anticoagulation. So, for example, initiating anticoagulant therapy and maintaining oral anticoagulant therapy. And perhaps we need to revisit those and, and make these more um, accessible because I had punted around on the web for quite a while to track these documents down in the archives. We also need to ensure our written policies and procedures are up to date. Um, interesting that the BS, uh, the British Society of Haematology's most recent guidance is from around 2008. And perhaps we need to be revisiting um, those guidelines to make sure that, that, that they are fit for purpose in 2022. Um, warfarin itself hasn't changed, it's just the patient cohort that we're treating has changed quite significantly and perhaps they need to be more of a focus for the guideline. And then audit. We should be auditing our anticoagulant services using um, the safety indicators that have already been highlighted again by the MPSA and that, that should inform our local actions about safe use of anticoagulants and commissioners. As, as a commissioner, I should know how well my anticoagulant services um, are performing because they all should be able to provide this audit data and, and, and the audit data requirements are there. So I, what I hope we can do now really is talk about, well, what should we do? Do we need to update that NPSA guidance and make it more accessible for 2022? 
and beyond? Do we need to review local commissioning arrangements? Now, I can tell you in South East London, we have six boroughs. Each borough has a different anti-coag service. We have a two hospital-based services um, that initiate water and andoac. In central London, all tubes, trains and buses go to hospital. It's actually quite hard to move services out of hospital. Then across the other four boroughs, we have four different models. We have community pharmacy initiating and managing warfarin and DOACs in one borough. We have um, a mixed model between hospital and community pharmacy in another borough. We have a GP hub system in a, a third borough. And we have every GP practice commissions in a fourth borough. And I think we need to, as warfarin, num uh, the number of patients receiving warfarin is reducing, we probably need to revisit where they are most appropriately managed, um, who as individuals should be managing those patients and, and how do we ensure competence? Should we define a minimum number of patients that need to be seen by a service to maintain competence in warfarin dosing? Is it acceptable that a GP might only be dosing a handful of patients? Um, or should it be at individual clinician level that that competence is determined? And I'm hoping that Matt, Matt and Haley and I can have a, a conversation about this at, towards the end about well, are those the sorts of things we need to think about um, going forward to maintain the safety of these um, services? I don't know whether anticoag services are still implementing the MPSA recommendations. I'm aware that within the structure of large hospitals with thousands of anticoag patients, um, that you know there are thrombosis committees this is looked at regularly I don't know where the services that are more disparate multiple GP practices offering the service who's collating the audit standards are they reviewed both internally and externally workforce in small practices moves on regularly and how do they ensure new people coming in are trained to the same standard and are we all operating to the same uh, guidelines I've always said I don't really mind what service model is as long as the quality is there. But over time, the, the challenges of delivering quality um, is increasing because the proportion of patients receiving warfarin and therefore the number of patients individuals are seeing it is dropping all the time. And I think that does represent a challenge to uh, the system. One of the things that happened as a result of COVID as well is, uh, is that um, one of our large centres in South East London King's College Hospital identified um, over anticoagulation occurring during COVID in infection because patients were coming in with INRs above eight who previously been very stable. And I don't think we'd have picked that up necessarily, apart from the fact that Kings had a very robust anticoag service and were you know, seeing every patient that was coming through the system. Um, if we'd had much more disparate services, we we're not necessarily able to see the safety issues and trends and ensure that we can really intervene early. So I do think there may be a critical mass of warfarin patients that services should be managing. And interesting that Hayley talked about national benchmarking of services. I didn't really know there was a national benchmarking system. <laughs> so I clearly uh, behind the times. And again, I don't know which of our services are actually inputting uh, or assessing their service against these national uh, benchmarks. I think lots of smaller services are much harder to um, ensure uh, ongoing quality and safety, um, partly because the, the proportion, the number, absolute numbers of patients going through are too small necessarily to see those trends. So I'm going to leave some of these questions hanging and hope that we can have uh, a discussion really about where do we go um, next. So I'll hand back to you, Matt. So oh, Helen, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm going to thank Hayley once again for the, the pair of presentations there that I think really complement each other to ask a series of questions. Um, and I'd like people to either use the question option on the on Zoom or, or the chat box uh, to, to join in with our discussion. But I'm going to, to start, I and mean, it's actually a kind of slightly tangential um, warfare question. When, back in the day, we would start somebody on an anticoagulant, and I referred to Haley, your anticoagulation service, and I would say, please warfarinize this patient. 
one of the things that would happen there is that expert team would say, right, this is a mechanical valve. The GP said two to three, but we know that's not actually the recommendation. So therefore we will appropriately anticoagulate, anticoagulate because we as a, a team are specialists and we know, and he's a GP and by definition a generalist. Um, and then we hear Helen saying about this inappropriate use of DOAX in certain clinical situations. And many of us are aware of the inappropriate dosing of DOAX in many situations where they're not being adjusted due to renal function. So do we think when we're talking about anticoagulation, there's a, actually a fundamental educational issue where we've expected all our generalists to suddenly become anticoagulation specialists? A nod from Hayley there. And, and any ideas how we can address that? Do you feel that like, you know, if somebody's going to be anticoagulated, a specialist should be, should be asked? Or can we leave that with just trickle down um, education um, about the DOA? It's difficult, isn't it? Because, you know, as we have a reduction in the number of patients on warfarin. It's remembering those things like you don't use loading in patients with protein C and protein S deficiency. So it, I, I think I would find it very difficult if I was just um, providing anticoagulant management as part of a much wider role. It, is so so specialist now um it when we had the doax um introduced in, in bournemouth and pool we were continually finding it difficult we were getting doses um prescribed wrongly and the pharmacist couldn't check it because of course all the doax have different dose for different indications and when the patient turns up with a prescription they've got no way of checking what the creatinine clearance is what the weight is um, and what the indication is so we introduced a checklist and now none of the pharmacists will issue a DOAC unless it is accompanied with a DOAC checklist and they have to indicate what the reason for anticoagulation is. I'll put that in the swag bag. Um, and it also puts the patient's weight, their creatinine clearance, and the dose per drugs are all on that. That was a big safety increase for us. And of course, it enabled the pharmacist to check that the patients were getting the correct um, drug. And it also enabled um, the correct indication of the follow-up. So we tend to use a creatinine clearance divided by 10 to indicate when that patient should have repeat bloods. But if I didn't have that, or if I was a clinician out there without that, I would find it very complicated for, for patients. And we know, don't we, Matt, that there are, there's evidence that people aren't getting the monitoring the renal checks. I mean, if you just look at renal checks, about a third of patients haven't had a renal check in the last 12 months, partly again because of COVID. Now, that's one of the reasons why the PCN um, Investment and Impact Fund has an indicator around ensuring renal functions checked uh, on DOAX, um, that body weight is checked. So you're not using a seven, eight year old body weight because we clearly we don't know if that's accurate but creatinine clearance is actually calculated and the dose is is it you know coded as either correct or changed because those are the four things we did a very exhaustive audit in in southwark um of 2200 patients on doax looking at the monitoring and putting in interventions and practices um to ensure this was addressed and those are the four key issues that we found no recent body weight renal function being done in a scattergun approach so some people were having them done quarterly for no reason, didn't need it. And other people were, who needed it six monthly were only getting it once every 18 months. So embedding the right frequency of checks, um, making sure creatinine clearance was actually um, calculated and then making sure someone acted on it. Because even when it had been calculated, it was in the notes. Sometimes it hadn't been acting on, acted on. 
So we hope that will improve things. In Southwark now, we're at 97% of DOACs um, have had all the right monitoring, uh, and we hope that the IF will help support delivery of that sort of level across the country. Um, I, 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 I agree, but one of the things, Helen, that I think we just highlighted there is that in this uh, you know, dash for gas, so to speak, you know, maybe we need to run those big searches again to make sure the valves are still being protected mm. and, and those people who shouldn't be moved from warfarin to to um doac and the doxaban uh through the iif the iif um we we make sure that we we, we are providing those lists once again because we're under a similar pressure to 2020 um mm. when when we made that those errors the first time um, I'm going to, to move us a, a away from DOAX to, yeah. to Warfarin. Um, um, I've been around the atrial fibrillation world for, for quite a while. And one of our big issues when myself and, uh, and Dr. Campbell Cowan were, were pushing the anticoagulation agenda, trying to move anticoagulation uh, in AF from maybe 40% slightly better, Helen, I had the, the pleasure of watching your presentation at HRC, where we're now into the high 80%. These were figures that me and Campbell couldn't have believed of back at the, the turn of the decade. Um, now, one of the th factors we recognised is what we called the FAF factor of warfarin. <laughs> now, if you were um, a Bradford patient when I started in practice and you lived in the north of the city, to be on warfarin, you would have a two bus journey, half a day trip to get to the warfarin clinic and back. Um, and we felt that that might influence how people chose to, to look after themselves and prevent their stroke. So we were big advocates of everybody doing warfarin. Um, so GP practices or groups of GP practices clumping around. Helen, as you say, you, you helped commission that service where uh, the pharmacists, the community pharmacists got involved in warfarin. Now that was fine when everybody was on warfarin, yeah. there was no alternative. Um, but what we, we were hearing from Haley then, and it's definitely my practice, I've seen in my practice, is that 90% of my anticoagulation is now DOAC. Um, and so what about those people who do depend on that local pharmacy, that, that local GP practice, so they don't have to trek all the way to the hospital? How are we going to preserve that convenience that we've generated for warfarin to allow us to reduce a decade ago? How can we preserve that, that convenience for the patient? I work in secondary care, but it doesn't mean that my warfarin patients have to come to the hospital for a blood test. I've got a third of patients can go along to their GP surgery. We have bands go around, collect those bloods, bring them in. As I said, I've got 151 patients that self-test. I've got some patients that prefer to come to the hospital because of the good buzz routes, et cetera. And I've got 129 patients that have a district nurse so just because anticoag services sometimes are placed within secondary care does not mean that they have to come to secondary care for blood tests it's enabling bloods to be taken and of course if we could get point of care testing provided for patients then that would make a big impact on our patients Yep. I think there's two big things I'd like to highlight there from what you've said, Hayley. One is anticoagulation clinics aren't a physical thing or don't have to be a physical thing. Mm. They're a conceptual thing. So the idea that we can keep that convenience for our patient and the person who's anticoagulated, but the expertise is still the high quality of a high well, high throughput uh, service means that they continue to, to keep safe. I think the other point you've raised there about self-testing and, and point of care um, kit. During the um, 
heat of the COVID pandemic, it was virtually impossible to get hold of a collector check. If, even if you could afford it, you couldn't get it. Um, and it's always been, there's been a resistance of um, the NHS to provide um, self-testing kit. But now we're talking about one in 10 of the anticoagulated population rather than the whole of the anticoagulated population requiring access. Is this something that as organisations, the ASA, the Thrombosis UK, we could start pushing to a lobby government that those patients who are obliged to have warfarin and have the capability of self-testing can't we allow them access to self-testing kit so that their test on the clinical expertise for their management can be separated um, without any loss of convenience for patients. And of course, we need to make sure that for those patients that are self-testing, that we're doing the quality control checks. And we know that self-testing isn't for everybody. We know that, you know, if you've got antiphospholipid, it's not always a good correlation with some of the machines. I totally agree, though. It's really quite frustrating that, um, you know, NICE have given guidance, uh, a technology guidance about recommending self-testing and yet there's still resistance which results in people only getting access to self-testing if they can afford to buy their own machine and the only time we've ever managed uh, at, a, at a system level to provide them through the NHS was when we secured COVID monies to say well mm. we've got shielding patients who we can't manage we need to give them a, a device and that was the only way in the last 20 years that I've managed to get funded Blaggy checks and um, I kind of hoped it might build from there but we still haven't seen much uh, movement but compared to the price of NOAC for example a quaggy check and iron R strips are not yeah. going to bankrupt the NHS for the cohort of patients that are, are suitable for uh, self-testing and yet it seems to be such a struggle. Um, it would be nice to see a reduction in the cost of the machines. Yeah. Although they're getting more and more fancy, aren't they, with the Bluetooths and yes, capabilities yes, of... Yeah. And I guess digital innovation gives us more opportunity as well to separate monitoring from wherever the services um, are, are driven. You know, there are companies that can provide that access, um, at that those linkages between patients, practices and, and the um, and the anticoag service to make things a bit more seamless. Yeah. Um, it was straight off the bat um, into the questions. Our friend and colleague, Sue Bacon, who uh, I think we, we all know on the panel, um, highlighted that one of the conditions that cannot have a DOAC, of course, is APS, so antiphospholipid syndrome. And one of the issues when we come to self-testing or, or collect the check is, is APS. So not only do we need to look at how we can provide this for those patients, who it's appropriate for, so uh, a mechanical valve. And we know, if we look at the German data, we know that actually self-testing and, and actually even self-management in, in, in valvular disease um, is actually comparable, if not slightly better, to clinic-based care. Um, but we need to make sure that those patients with antiphospholipid syndrome don't inadvertently get a device which is giving them the wrong information. Um, just to, to move us on to a, a, a second point that um, both Haley and, and, and Helen brought up in their presentation is if we're going to have the, the locality clinic, whether that be in a, a hub of GPs where it used to be just one GP um, or um, in the community pharmacies, how do we keep up that competence? Again, I'm going to just remind um, everybody in the audience about Haley's comment there that although she's dramatically reduced the number of warfarin patients in her service, she's only actually reduced the work by about 20% because those patients who are left behind are the patients which always consumed the time. They were the valves, they were the complex, hard to balance. Um, patients, the patients where that risk between thrombosis and bleeding balance is very precarious. So as a smaller service where you gained your experience through the 
the, the stable patient and the, the easy patient was how you got to really get your teeth into it. Now they've gone and all every patient's a complex patient. Where does the competency come from? I mean, I did and used to support the NCAT, uh, the National Coagulation Training Centre um, in, in Birmingham and then Warwick, but that, that's not here anymore. So where is the competency, competency coming and how are we judging? How is the commissioner assessing that competence? I would suggest that the commissioner isn't necessarily assessing that. They're commissioning a provider and the expectation is the provider um, provides with competent staff and the expectation is the provider service should ensure that. But it's very hard to um, to police, I guess you would say. In this new world of ICSs as well, there's going to be a lot less, you know, um, oversight and, and very strict commissioning about how services, certainly in our area, it's much more about the system coming up with solutions. We want you to do X, Y, and Z at a, at a very high level and you decide how it uh, is best delivered. Um, and, and that's why I think, you know, the, the services themselves need to take responsibility as, as Haley's already, already demonstrated, which I think is much easier in a, a big hospital setting with some of the governance that sits around it than it is as an individual GP practice, perhaps commissioned under a locally commissioned service to provide um, uh, warfarin um, to have the time to coordinate that sort of um, governance and audit, etc. So I think there's a sort of economy of scale, isn't there, around uh, the the wraparound safety services that we need to have in place for anticoagulant provision. And we have to remember, many of the services are actually only commissioned to do warfarin in patients with AF or warfarin in patients with VTE in, in you know in, in community settings. And, and these complex patients are still remaining under a hospital in many places. But that means that the exist the warfarin patients within those services are, you know, minuscule numbers because, you know, they don't, they can go on to DOACs, most of the patients that uh, have AF and VTE and will be on DOACs. And there may be a very, very small handful of, of warfarin patients um, within those individual services, perhaps only one or two or three patients. And, and I'd struggle to see how competency can be maintained and the risks around comorbidities not being recognised, um, uh, you know, valves, etc., uh, go up if we um, delegate down to that very small number of patients across a broad system. So as a, as a commissioner, though, Helen, you know, you don't just say anticoagulation. I mean, that's it. And like, yeah, the, the provider just goes, yes, I, I've heard of warfarin. There you go. Um, you know, you, you can define um, what you regard as the output. So not only is it that you're anticoagulating patients, but you could put in any commissioning document, as Haley is, that she's externally validated. Right. Um, and that is part of your commissioning, um, is that, you know, I'm not going to watch you, but you have to be watched. Um, yeah. you yeah. have to be benchmarked. But the um, benchmarking is actually with the computer provider. The benchmarking, nobody asks me what my benchmarking is. I, I publicise it once we get our audit data out. Um, but no, nobody asks me, no commissioner asks me what the commissioners um, are monitoring, uh, the number of INRs, the dose interventions, we monitor, you know, our workload through telephone calls received and made. Uh, but actually, we're not monitored, even in secondary care, for what we're providing. When, we, we, we did when make recommendations um, about what commissioners should be looking at. I'm just aware, sitting on the commissioning side, how little time commissioners have to actually review and uh, uh -huh. and, and uh, ensure that services are delivering at the level that's laid out in service specifications. And as I'm saying, I'm not sure how detailed service specifications will be in future. It'll be interesting to see over the next few years how things evolve. Uh, and I think I think that point is is well made. I, I do apologise if you can hear some background noise. I'm having my chimney fixed. Um, <laughs> so. Um, where I would also agree is, I mean, I've, I've always done audit. I've all, we've always been externally um, 
quality controlled by, with NEQAS uh, for our service. And I've never found anybody who wanted the data. Uh, I mean, I was always very interested in my own data, uh, mainly so I could try and show off to Haley that I could do it in primary <laughs> care as well. Uh, but no, yes, I agree that, that, that nobody seems to want. But I think that, as you say, uh, Helen, um, the Safety Alert 18 is archived now. Um, I, I've still got my original copy. And I can't see that there is much in that document that has changed. Warfarin is still warfarin. It's still an excellent drug when it's an excellent drug and managed well. Do we need to get that out of the archive? I think we do. I mean, it might need to, uh, obviously MPSA doesn't exist anymore. We'd probably need to rebadge it, but I think getting it out to the system, whether it's through NHS or through British Society of Hematology, Primary Care Cardiovascular Society, I think we need to revisit some of the messages. And it, it, there's so much in there, actually, and loads of supporting resources, but very hard to track down. And um, I think we need to remind people because clearly nobody's been looking at it since... 2012 or whenever it sort of faded off the um, agenda a little bit as DOAX came along. I think it would be really good to have a national recognised anticoagulant course. There are so many anticoagulant courses. Uh, Pressgrip have just updated their anticoagulant course, but it would be very good if there was a, a, a national anticoagulant competency based course mm -hmm. as you say um back in the day i was involved with david fitzmorris and ellen murray's anticoagulant um, program and anybody that wanted to provide an anticoagulant um course attended that I think it was a three month course. Then we went out and we assessed actually in practice and we gave them a certificate um, back in the day. Do we need a joint society's recommendations for safe use of warfarin that yeah. basically took MPSA and, and, and you know, remodeled it for 2022? I think that's a, an excellent point Helen. I, I think we need guidance and I think that having something like that might actually make the life of a commissioner slightly easier because there's a document they can refer to um, where we where we don't really have that at the moment we've just, we can essentially the commissioner has to write that every time you know in every region of the country to to define that specification um, Apologies, I'll stop sharing. I forgot my screen was still shared. <laughs> Although the questions were useful, in case Matt needed a prompt. <laughs> um, so another question that has come through is, so we have our patient on warfarin, and it's appropriate that they either still have the right to choose, of course, or that they have a specific situation which requires warfarin, and they need to go for a procedure. And that warfarin is is discontinued i mean if it's an air if it's just a, you know there, there's really no situation i would su suspect that the warfarin would now be stopped outright we're talking about bridging situations who restarts the warfarin well for my service we see all of the patients that are coming into the hospital so we see the patients uh, prior to their surgery, we stop the warfarin, we commence the low molecular weight bridging, we provide um, the post-operative dosing and we arrange the post-op follow-up. So for me, that's provided by the anticoagulant service. We teach think... patients to self-inject and we provide the sharp box. I think where you are the primary provider for warfarin and anticoagulant services in a geography, that, that works really well. We have the problem where our, a patient might go to a tertiary centre for surgery. Their anticoagulant is being prescribed by a GP. 
the GP says, well, I'm not doing the surgery. It's not my responsibility to sort out the bridging. It's the surgeon's responsibility. The surgeon says, I don't even know why they're on <laughs> anticoagulation. So how can I make a decision about whether or not they need bridging? And you end up with this sort of tug of war between who should be responsible and, and who shouldn't. Uh, in most of our sites, uh, our big tertiary centres, the anticoag service locally gets, you know, within the within the hospital gets involved to help make a judgment about it. But it does cause a bit of friction between the, the different parts of the system, partly because it's not commissioned as a joined up service. And the theory of the ICS system is these services should operate much more seamlessly uh, in the future. But clearly that also is going to take some time for organisational barriers to be removed and for us to start working much better as partners across um, these geographies. We do have some GPs that provide their own anticoag service, but those patients still come through to us. So we get them referred from our pre-assessment colleagues, et cetera. And the premise is that the hospital is providing the surgery, then it's part of the charge for yeah. surgery. <laughs> Part of the package of care. Package of care, that's it. That's <laughs> the terminology. As you quite rightly have said earlier again, Hayley, that you know, as a anticoagulation provider in general practice, all my therapies invariably oral. Um, as a anticoagulation specialist in a hospital, actually all modalities of anticoagulation fall under your purview and your team are competent at using them. Um, so you know, it, it is that that slightly different view in different sites. Uh, another interesting comment from the audience, of course, is when we're talking about competencies, we're not talking about GPs, we're not just talking about um, coagulation services, we're talking about all the members of the team, and in some places that's pharmacists as well. So do we have a competency framework for an anti-coagulation practitioner, or do we have to specify where that practitioner may have come from. So did they come from a pharmacy background, a nurse background, a, a, a doctor background? And I would argue that actually the competency framework is that if you're doing this job, you're doing this job as a, a, an anticoagulation practitioner and the competencies are the same, irrespective of your uh, the nature of your initial qualification. And we're seeing that flexibility now in so many roles within the NHS that you know we, we where it used to be the doctor did this the nurse did that and the pharmacist gave the medication all those lines have been rubbed out uh, and it, uh, we need a competency framework for the job not for the necessarily the, the, the practitioner i would suggest and um, we're just into the, the final few minutes so in, in summary i i would like to pull out a couple of big threads one is that we haven't finished the job in educating clinicians around the use of anticoagulations in all its modalities, DOAC or Warfarin. And we need to make sure that we continue to work in our localities to make sure that people are prescribing competently and safely for the different conditions. We do need to make sure that in those patients where we've made Warfarin locally available and convenient to the patient, we don't allow that to be dismantled as we reduce the amount of warfarin that we use. But we need to make sure that the services that are providing that are as competent as possible. And as Helen suggested, there's a couple of things that we could start to as Thrombosis UK, AF Association, the Anticoagulation Specialist Association, these groups of us who are interested, heart bound voice, to get together with the Royal Societies to ensure that a updated safety alert 18 is produced that is functional for a modern world um, where warfarin is not the big beast it used to but it's still a beast and it's still needed and it needs yeah. to be used safely so once again i'd like to thank uh, my co-panel um, with Haley Fabel and helen williams i've hoped you find that this is an interesting discussion and it shouldn't stop with the closing credits. I hope you take this back into your institutions and continue to have that conversation, engage with Joe Jerome and Thrombosis UK, mm -hmm. and let's see if we can make warfarin 
a safe and convenient talk for those patients who have to have it. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>